there you are. Boom. All right. Joey, what's up? Live stream is on here. Here we are. We are with uh, we're the Shaney Exchange Flagler here. This is Chicago Joey, a.k.a. Joey Ramon, for a, uh, another episode of my Poker Live podcast series. Shaney, how you doing today, buddy? Doing pretty good. How are you? I j literally just woke up seconds ago. Um, it's been a... I, I... Damn, it's loud. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. Where you, uh, where, you, where you live at right now? Santa Monica, California. Oh, my God. Look at this guy. Rough life, huh? Just by the ocean. Well, you know. Everyday yeah. struggles exist here, too. <laughs> how, do you, uh, how do you like living out there? I love it, man. I really love uh, being by the coast and the weather and the women, everything. Just, you know, the scenery. Beautiful California coast to me is everything. God damn! I can tell this podcast is going to be interesting already because that's a that's a that's an interesting answer. Most people that I had asked that question to, they would say that they're like, "Yeah, it's okay. You know, I get to go to the water and um, the beach. It's cool." So, no, I love it. I mean, coming from New York, especially, um, yeah, it just seems more free in a way. Like people don't give it like. Just L.A. in general, I feel like people sort of mind their own business and aren't up in your shit as much as where I come from. You know, New York, everyone's kind of stacked on top of each other. And, um, and yeah, just like, I don't know, the coastal breeze and the attitude out here just kind of works for me. You know, I was in Mexico for a couple of years, which is also on the coast, but doesn't quite so, have the same vibe. So for people that don't know who, much about you, because I think most people listening to my podcast are mainly uh, – Paul and Omaha players, because I that's the main podcast that I do. Right. You're an interesting guy, so I'll I'll try to give a little backstory on you. In my opinion, what I think from my knowledge, and you can confirm, deny, fill in some blanks, and sure. um, go from that point. So, am I allowed to smoke on this podcast? You, of course, you can smoke. You can drink. I mean, the yeah. drunker you get, I mean, the better. That's 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 you know what we're all that kind of stuff. So. Do we know how many people are watching? Um, we, we have 13 viewers right now. It, it, oh, if you thanks. go to the YouTube link that I tweeted out, or it'll, uh, it'll have the comments people can leave. If anyone has any questions or comments throughout the podcast, they're more than welcome to go post them on YouTube. So the number of viewers sometimes fluctuates up and down, and yeah, I never know. Like, sometimes I get 100, sometimes I get 50, sometimes I get 30, sometimes I get 20, so. Oh, wow, I see. This is fascinating. Okay. Gotcha. So go. Uh, sorry, sorry to step on your intro or whatever you're about oh, to say. Okay, go ahead. You're you're used to hosting a podcast anyway, so I'm sure you have your own your own speed and your own your the way you do things or you you're used to doing things. So I'm I'm trying to do them at your speed, dude. All right, cool. I think, did I turn it down? I think I did. Let me turn this up here. Okay, cool. I think the volume should be fine on both levels. All right. So you've been playing. You're you're not necessarily a professional poker player anymore, but you were a professional poker player for a very long time. You played primarily only tournaments. You were sponsored by Poker Stars for a period of time. You relocated to Mexico, as you stated, for a couple of years. And at some point, you decided that you had enough of the grind. You're also a writer too, which is like you know, kind of a you do right now. And I'm not quite sure how extensive you you wrote before but we'll definitely get into that because I think it's pretty cool but at some point in time you decided you're like fuck poker I'm gonna announce my kind of retirement sort of thing well, okay I mean lo let me clarify at that point like I never really said fuck poker or or that I'm retiring or quitting I never made any claims to like leaving the game behind I just said like that I want to I stopped playing professionally, I guess. Stopped playing full time. Stopped having my life revolve around poker, but continue to play, keep my game sharp, and actually, hopefully, like through that, find my love for the game again. Like, just I think poker for me is kind of a great hobby more than it is a great profession. Mm. So right, and also I want to focus on an even like less stable profession known as writing. Um, I have been writing since I was like really fourteen or something, thirteen, fourteen. I started writing for the school paper, but I've never really made a run at it trying to be a professional. Um, so now I'm working on a couple things that we'll see. Hopefully I can make money as a writer eventually, long term. It's kind of like when, when we started out in poker and like you're playing whatever, like I was playing the $10 rebuy thinking I could 
thinking I had the skills to like play a 10k, but still being kind of far away from that. That's kind of where I am with my current pursuit. Um, so I'm just kind of grinding. Just kind of, uh, so you feel like at writing right now, you're at a, you're at like the micro stakes in a way where you have to sort of get better and work your way up and make friends. In a way, yeah. Yeah, like I haven't, you know, I like I said, I've been writing since I was 13. I was even published at around the age 17 in a, in a sort of like legitimate newspaper mm -hmm. um, in New York called New York Press. But I have never, yeah, I haven't proven my professionalism or my ability to like do it for a living or sustain just even like the practices that a professional writer must have. You know, writing every day for a couple of hours, three hours and... Just advancing the work, yeah, consistently. So from that point on, you you decide to stop playing poker full time. So yeah, I mean, really, was, yeah, I couldn't be in Mexico anymore. Like that was kind of getting to me. I I know that all too well. That's the reason I moved back from Canada. Was I was just like, I was there for a year. I was like, I was going crazy. I was like, because with Canada, I always felt weird leaving and coming back because I had all my stuff there and like you hear so many borders horror stories like people just not getting back in right. for reason or getting grilled and, and I think you actually didn't get into Canada is that correct? I didn't once but the thing the funny thing is I mean prior to not prior to prior to being denied entry I did spend a month in Canada I spent a month in Yale Town, Vancouver but oh. it was a similar thing like I was like well if I leave I don't even know if I can come back and then my friend, who I was my roommate, he got denied entry. So I really felt like I couldn't risk leaving my stuff up there. But just in general, it's more just that thing where like you're never home, like or you don't know where your home is. Um, so wait, you're not you're not grinding Supernova Elite type stuff like you used to, or? I mean, I I did that. I haven't done that for a couple of years. Once I started actually making money playing poker. I stopped uh -huh. grinding Supernova Elite because you make way more money playing poker than you do actually playing going for Supernova Elite. Oh, so that was your arc? Like you were more, you were like a rake back grinder, and then you got really good at PLO? Or? Yeah, well, I, I had 24 tables for a long time, and I was like unaware you could actually play six tables. You didn't have to play as many <laughs> tables as poker stars would let you, you know, because you fall into that rake BPP FPP trap, which I think even a lot of people are still in these days. Is is you don't realize you can actually work on your game, play six tables, and actually make much more money while also getting better at poker. So, and yeah. right. Well, some I mean that might not everyone has that skill set, right? Some people their best bet is going to be the twenty-four table and just try to. Think. It's hard. You don't know. I mean, that's what I always thought too. And then the day I stopped twenty-four tabling, I was like, oh wait, never, oh, oh never mind. That's actually not true. So. So your I, reputation as a as a PLO expert is only like. Recent, like since giving up on the SNE grind, maybe a couple of years, yeah. Okay, yeah. I guess I'm a little behind the loop. I just mostly remember you from those crazy, like last minute pushes to get Supernova Elite that yeah. made you some two plus two. I always made it challenging for myself. It's it's <laughs> too easy, you know. Who wants to make things easy in these bets? You don't want to make just like smoke every pop bet you do, and then everyone after two or three weeks is like, "Wow, okay, that was easy." You want to draw it out, and you know, like I felt like during that last bet I did, I fell in love for a week while I was in Vancouver, and I didn't really play poker for a week, and then the last week I had to play eighteen hours a day. You know what happens? So it's just what what, what happened after the week? You were no longer in love. Well, she went down to Mexico. She was living in Vancouver for poker, and then she went to Mexico. Because she's from Mexico? No. Or, oh, I got you. I got you. She's going to live with her, live with her boyfriend, I think. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> you know those tournament players, kid? They're some weird people, man. You're a tournament guy. You know how it goes. I wonder who it is. Uh, yeah. Um, I wonder who it is, too. You know, I wonder. <laughs> we, okay, we, we we even got we we're still on we're still on the uh, the career trajectory for you here. So at some point in time, you decide it's a good idea to write a piece on the article on the, I'm sorry on the website Slate, correct? Uh huh. You decide that you think it's a good idea to write an article on Slate, <laughs> detailing your drug use for your for your whole entire life. And if you follow on two plus two, which I think most of our listeners do, there's a very large thread in the news views gossip that relates around that idea. And now, uh, I can't even imagine. What? What? what Why did you do that? What, what was? was what was? Uh, you what was? The, what were you thinking at the time? How do you look at that in retrospect? 
Um, those are good question. Because I, it's not like I, it's not like I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, but I, I, I kind of wanted to write a piece like that for many years. Like, I don't know. I just felt, I don't know. Being honest would have some benefit. Um, and then on a more basic level, at the time I wrote it, it was partly to promote the podcast that I do, Dope Stories Podcast, DopeStories.com. dot com. Um, and. I don't, you know, so why did I do it? I did it because I thought it would be refreshing to write something honest um, and just sort of, I don't know, I guess that's it, just refreshing to write something honest, um, to try to reshape a stigma, to put myself in a, in a vulnerable way, like to examine issues that are complicated. And, um, yeah, in retrospect, I think it's been really positive. Uh, like to, you know, since you asked me, like, what do I, what do I look back now and think about it? It's sort of like, it actually has been positive. There was a lot of like negative, sort of, I don't know. There were a lot of uh, a lot of things were said. I was sort of crippled for a couple of weeks, like emotionally, like just not even knowing why I wrote it or what, even what I had said. So many things were being projected onto me that I didn't even really, I couldn't even really remember what I said. I couldn't like go back and read the text and just like think about. But going back and reading it, it's like, yeah, I just kind of presented an honest accounting. I didn't really try to come to too many conclusions. And the end result is I think it's helpful um, in terms of really figuring out what, like, you know, your drug problems are or your substance abuse issues are. Like, it's, it's really convenient to sort of, like, keep it all hidden and, and be ashamed of it and then, like, act out in various ways or just... I don't know, use that shame to try to find a solution, but I don't know, if you just kind of like put the truth out there, there might be like a more subtle solution, it might not, and, and in the end you realize no one actually gives a shit, like yes, there was that NVG thread, but it dies, and, and no one really cares, it's like, and the whole point was like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm chronicling something that I've been doing since before I ever knew what Texas Hold'em was, um, before any of you knew what I was, or I knew what any of this was, I don't know, this is just life, and, like, because of the stigma, I've been forced to sort of hide this habit, my occasional crack-smoking habit. Um, I, there's a huge stigma around it, and um, I don't know, I guess just sort of, like, unleashing myself of that secrecy I thought might have some benefit, and I guess we'll see. Time will tell. But right now, it feels like it did have a benefit. It created an open dialogue, helped me understand myself a little bit better, and also... Yeah, it helped me understand a little bit better how conveniently we place the blame on drugs. Like, when there's all these other problems going on in, in our lives, my life, and it just helps me identify where drugs exacerbate those problems and where they really don't have that much to do with those problems so I can actually focus on problems in my life and fixing those harder, settle-to-reach to issues. Well, I think, I think obviously what you've, probably known for a long time and what you found especially with like the thread on 2 plus 2 in the comments is that when it comes to an idea like using drugs and drug use most people's minds pretty made up one way they don't you know there I but there is a pretty decent amount of people who are pretty open minded and they are willing to when when you write something like that or when you present you know kind of your thinking on it they actually are able to look at it and then say well may, you know maybe this guy's right maybe he has a point where a lot of most people that I meet when I talk about, you know, raging or using drugs or anything like that to, you know, my family or some friends, they, there's literally zero percent. They're never, they're never going this way on it. They're always going this way where it's terrible, it's bad, don't do it. There's no good out of it. Right. And I kind of tell some people like, I mean, I think it's some good out of it. I mean, and that's obviously debatable. I, I, there's definitely going to be, like I said, a large number of people who there's no fucking chance that they they think that. There's zero percent chance that there's any good. Well, we've been given this convenient sort of like script to follow, like that is strictly based on that. Like, as long as as long as you can, it, no one considers that unreasonable to say, oh, drugs are bad, no good can come from it. But of course, there's a benefit from it. Um, before any problems arise, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. Now the other thing is, I mean, I think poker players are more open-minded to these types of concepts um, because, like, poker itself was a very stigmatized profession. Like, if you think about it, in like whenever we started, when I don't know when you started, but 
certainly like in the pre money maker or right like in that money maker era when there weren't a lot of professional poker players if you said you were a professional poker player they're going to say no good's going to come of that you're going to lose all your money what makes you think you can do that and we as poker players have to sort of like fight that stigma within our individual like microcosms like explain to our parents how there was a benefit how we were making money or how it was unconventional but there there was money to be made so we have experience with like being open minded towards stigmatized areas of life so that i think you know the response in the poker community has been pretty refreshing it's like at least we, you know i'm not a lot of people don't necessarily agree with me or you know don't are, no one's saying crack is good by the way or drugs are good it's just like let's just talk realistically about them and i think poker players are, are are able to have that kind of kind of conversation it's like instead of being like oh you know pocket kings always get cracked it's like well let's actually like have an analytical discussion about you know the nature of cards and game theory and so you you did, you were doing like as you as you said, and I thought you actually started the podcast after you did that. So you do have a podcast called Dope Stories. I think you've done about twelve, thirteen episodes. <coughs> we just put out episode twenty today. Twenty? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse my cough. Oh, that's all good. So you put. Um, that was thirteen. Well, maybe the last time you checked, we put out one a week. I'm not a professional researcher, kid. I, when I go into these podcasts, I look up a couple things, but I just like to go. I just like to go in there and like okay. let it flow out. I don't want any pre preconceived notions. I want some ideas, things to talk about. But yeah, I've I listened like, to a couple. I listened to the Vegas one because I heard that one. It was exceptionally entertaining. So, um, thank you. About, and you talk about my, yeah, my co-host is Paul McGuire. We, uh, you know, he was a, a reporter in the poker world for a long time, and also an experienced drug user and. Uh, yeah, we started it. We started talking about it sort of last year, late 2013. Got it off the ground in um, February and put out one episode a week. That's that's been our goal. Put out one episode a week, and we call it a rational conversation about drug use, rational a rational discussion about drug use. And uh, yeah, so what, I've, we'll noticed, have what I've noticed on there is you get some pretty you get some pretty interesting guests. We've had some cool guests. I'm really happy with the guests we've had. Um, and yeah, we're, we're yeah. Uh, Greg Merson, I'm sure you know, um, came on to talk about his uh, his uh, experiences with drug use and poker and how it like interacts with his poker work, like poker life. And um, I mean, to, uh, we had Sean Azaridi, who's a medical marijuana activist for PTSD sufferers. And he's doing like a lot of work in Colorado trying to get. PTSD recognized as a legitimate medical um, uh, ailment or whatever, like under the ma medical marijuana uh, uh, guidelines. And I guess my favorite, or my you know, like guest I was really proud of getting was uh, Carl Hart, this doctor. Uh, or well, Dr. Carl Hart is a professor at Columbia University who wrote a book called uh, the, uh, High Price, which was. I mean, it sort of corresponds to like the slate piece I wrote in a way, w in the sense that like. Uh, it kind of gave me the courage to write it. Like his book really uh, details how a lot of the social conditions, malignant social conditions that existed and were attributed to like crack cocaine in the '80s, they really existed before crack came along. And it was just that then crack was like a convenient way of sort of I don't know painting a, a picture of, the, of vilifying a community and blaming a drug. When really there was like an underlying social dysfunction, and it also made me. And so anyway, Dr. Carl Hart came on episode eight, and I don't know his. And really, even after reading the book, it wasn't until like I talked to him that he sort of like, I don't know, he just blew my mind open, kind of just like made me realize how little I knew and, and how poorly I thought about some things. And, and actually, then like the next day, I went and played a poker tournament and won it, which I don't attribute. You know, I attribute to like just sort of having like a renewed confidence and presence of mind, like. After I talked about like being crippled emotionally after those couple of weeks, uh, writing the article, not really knowing where I stood, like I, I really felt I couldn't like face the poker world in a way. Mm. I don't know why. Um, and then, yeah, I had that interview with uh, Carl Hart, and I went back in and just had all this confidence and poise, and like felt like I had done something good in my life, and uh, I was here playing poker in an appropriate way, like just as I said I would, you know, kind of like as it fits into my life. And then I chopped up that tournament, this tournament at the bike, the World Series uh, circuit event. 
so that to me was the most uh, meaningful interview, I guess, or my favorite episode so far was what well, you know we got Carl Hart to come out and talk to us, and he sort of just like was like, no, you're kind of like still thinking about things all wrong, and that I don't know, that's a humbling but very like liberating thing to realize that you know nothing. <laughs> so if you were gonna suggest somebody checks it out. I like the Vegas ep episode. Your suggestion, yeah. episode eight with Dr. Carl Hart, is a pretty good one. So if there's one or two, like say you know someone's transitioning you over, they they they're interested in hearing more about you, you know which one or two would relate most to like a po guys that play poker for a living? Um, they should probably check out. You know, uh, well I guess the Vegas one was most poker specific. We talk about kind of like whoring it up in Vegas, and you know, right? Like yeah. uh, during the World <laughs> Series, or one. like. Huh? There's some interesting stories in that told by you in that podcast. <laughs> yeah, the, you know the perils of the perils of whoring it up and and everything. Um, um, I don't, you know, if you're interested in me, I don't know. I mean, we talk. I talk more extensively about like the crack thing. I think in episode four, um, we did a pretty interesting one with uh, around that time too with my co-host about his car accident and his how it developed into his oxy habit. Um. I don't know. I think there. Oh, the, another one I liked was the guest one we had. Another guest we had was the, the, uh, these people, high maintenance Ben and Katya from this uh, web series, High Maintenance. It's a really funny, like we, uh, thirteen minute, six to thirteen minute web series about a New York City weed messenger. Um, so we try to mix it up. We do different things. You know, we've done. We do everything that's from like very personal to some like sort of like an analyzing other people's other things that existed in history. We try to, I don't know, keep it a mix of like historical perspective, personal perspective. And maybe poker players would like the uh, April Fool's Day episode, Broke, st broke Stories. We, we <laughs> broke Stories is like our offshoot brand. I'm looking at some of these now. Very cool, very cool. So yeah, if you guys want to check it out, like you said, it's at dopestories.com. Also, you guys on iTunes? Yeah, we're on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud. Um, yeah. Put anything in there. You're at Twitter at Shane Schlager. Schlager. Yeah, they're gonna have a. They're not gonna be able to spell that because I definitely couldn't spell that when I was when I was looking you when I was looking up. But it do you try to spell it on Google? It just auto corrects it to your name. So. C H L E G. Yeah, it's not. It's, yeah, it used to be Schlesinger, and my grandfather took out the S I N. That makes so if sense. You take, if you take Schlesinger and take out the sin, that's my name. He's edited it into a, your current name now, huh? That's right. So you, uh, I was, I was going to ask you about the poker stuff, but I, I want to talk more about that. So when you do the podcast, you're talking about using drugs. Is this, is there any legal ramifications that come from this? I mean, can you get in trouble for anything in, like from doing that sort of thing? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's illegal to talk about doing drugs. I don't think it's illegal to even be high. Um, I, I mean, I guess what you're asking, I mean, perhaps the risk is that some authority becomes interested in me and chooses to do an investigation on me and attempts to catch me with some amount of drugs, but it, I never really have a significant amount of drugs on me. Mm. Um, and you know, the drugs I do have are pretty much legal by the state. You know, like, I, I pretty much only have marijuana in my house at any given time. And I have a, some legal protection from the state based on that. But I, So my short answer is no. I don't think I can get in trouble. Um, it could, I could more see it cause problems with future landlords or future employers or, you know, I basically will never get a job, period. <laughs> like, having written that, you know, I'm never going to get a job in the straight world. Um... You know, but uh, as far as legal trouble, no, I don't. I don't spend too much time worrying about it. Um, I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm just talking about things that are illegal. Just uh, one second. Shane looks like he's uh. Now I'm back. Oh, he's back. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, do you do you worry about me getting in trouble? Well, I would worry about. I don't talk about it very much. Believe me, if, if I felt like I couldn't get in trouble, I would blog and talk about it nonstop because it's fucking interesting stuff. But, but you, you do sort of allude to these things on Twitter and 
Yeah, but I don't actually talk. I mean, some of the stories that I've done is fucking... There's some fun... I mean, it's some very, like, when you think about the degenerate poker life and, like, you know, these people, a lot of times when you're coming up in the poker world and you're, like, dreaming about, like, what am I going to do when I get all this money? And I start traveling around, like, you know, hookers, drugs, blow, and, like, you, you like that's, like, the joke, like, the running joke kind of thing. Like, I literally took that to a pretty uh, intense scale for a, a while there when I was living in different countries and and going to a lot of music festivals, so. <laughs> Share those stories. What's the risk? <laughs> yeah, I don't think I want to, really. <laughs> well, I mean, you <laughs> In a way, I want to, but you know, also in a way, I guess uh, I'm, I'm also. You never know. I just, I guess there's, I guess, as you said, you know, when you wrote something like you wrote, you saw that there was some good that probably could have came out of that. And when I think more about it, I don't think there's probably much good that's going to come out of it for the most part. So, right. I mean, you know, we all have to like establish our own boundaries on that stuff. Um, yeah. That's yeah. Kind of, that's kind but of what I think you've, alluded, you've alluded to it. You must, so you there is some part of you that wants to let it out. It's just so much fun, though. I mean, I would suggest everyone goes to like you know, there's a music festival coming up uh, two weekends from now in Vegas called EDC, uh -huh. and that's one of the most fun experiences anyone could ever do. What are you gonna do there? Well, I mean, are you are you going there? I am going there. I, right on. I will be going. I'm going to Vegas. Uh, there's a music festival in Chicago this weekend that I'm going to. So you just, you just have like a huge appetite for listening to electronic dance music in a crowded a setting full of crowded people. A crowded well, setting. So I'm not usually the one of the people that's in the crowd. Me and my girlfriend or whoever I'm with, we're usually in the back. We actually really like to dance, and I, I work on dancing a lot. So we enjoy the dancing, we enjoy the, usually the people that we're with, me and my girlfriend, I mean that's like our time to really connect really strong, because you know like about drug love, when you're, you're on drugs and you're with another girl or you're with a woman that you that you have some sort of feelings for, it like intensifies I feel like that love that you two share together and it like kind of strengthens you two as, as a whole if, in a way, if that kind of makes sense. I'm not actually sure your experience is with that sort of thing. But. No, it does, yeah. But then the challenge to me I think is Maintaining that bond when the drugs wear off. That is the that is the challenge. That is, and I actually, in for the most part, I enjoyed it when it wore off because that first day, week, couple days, at last, you know, it, it's this otherworldly love. I felt like, but as you said, it does wear off, and then it's like, okay, fuck it, on to the next one. And obviously, you know, it's hard to have that mentality for everybody, but I had that mentality for quite a while. Onto the next one, what, what, uh, romantically, you mean? Or? Correct, yeah, onto the next one. Like, you know, I'd be in love for three to five days, sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks. Sometimes we don't leave the hotel room for two and a half weeks. We're just raging in the hotel room. And then when we leave that hotel room, it's over, and that's it. And then, you know, I don't mean that's it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, I got gotcha, you. You know, and, but the rea like, if you want, I think, in my experience, if you want to try, th those... I mean, drug experiences can be very helpful. I think between couples, really, and we don't. That, these these are the sorts of things that never get discussed because of how repressed we are. It's like I'm about to drink and all this shit, but you can't. You know, to the idea that you might like sniff a little coke or uh, do some ecstasy with your girlfriend, that's somehow taboo. Like, but no, of course. I mean, it can create can like really knock down barriers and allow you to feel that bonding. And then, yeah, like I say, drugs are sort of a shortcut. And then you kind of have to take the long way home. And that long way home is, like, if you want a relationship to work long term, you got to, like, deal with those sort of, like, everyday mundane things off of ecstasy <laughs> or ketamine or whatever the hell it is you're doing. Well, that's... Like, also, you got to realize, you know, that shortcut comes with... There can be... There's perils there, too. Like, I want to, like, tell you not to do too much Molly this summer. Like, if you do Molly, like, too often, you can... Screw up your, your serotonin intake levels or some shit. So, well, you know, I, go ahead. No, I say, I think at the point I'm at now, I'm not really, you know, when I first started doing it, I was like, oh, I'll fucking do some this weekend, three days a weekend, you know, and obviously you're like a noob at that point, so you're super into it, you're just excited. The, the, the high and the experience you're, you're getting initially is just this thing you've never experienced before, but. At some point in time, after a couple of years, I feel like you, you do settle down and you 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 realize like, all right, one that might not be the most healthy thing to do, and you know, two, 
I don't necessarily, you know, I don't feel like I need to do that. I'm not as obsessed or, you know, it doesn't like captivate me that right. much where I need to do it that often. So you can become more accepting of a once a month or once every couple of months sort of experience with it. Well, yeah, but I think in a way that I just, I guess I wish we had that sort of framework going into it. Like, we don't have good traditions really built around our drug use yet. And, like, so, I mean, I believe there's these, you know, there's, like, big electronic DJs who tell people, like, don't do ecstasy at the show, right? Or, you know, don't do drugs. That's basically the same message, but I think the message instead should be do drugs intelligently. You know, they should be saying, like, okay, we know you're going to... Basically, the implied message is, like, you're going to come to our show and, and dose out and do Molly and dance. Like, that's been going on at, at live music shows for decades. So if you're going to do that, know the risks. Like, you know, know the risks of MDMA. Like, pay attention to your dosage. And I just wish there were... You know, but there's no real room for that subtle message. It's like, I, I don't know, like, Avicii isn't going to be, like... Guys, just like do the right dose of Molly. A VT or whoever the hell is saying it, it's gonna be like, don't you know, don't bring Molly to my show. It's like that's not really helping anyone. Like I, you know, I'm more interested in like the same education that was sort of spread like on a grassroots level when I was coming up. Like the the first time I tried Molly was probably 20 years ago, and someone said, uh, was it, was it 20 years ago? No, a little more, like more like 15. Like someone was like, don't do it more than once a month because it can really like it can have like effects, I don't know, at the, at the time the, the rumor was it drained your spinal fluid, um, which I, sounds like bullshit, but I don't know, uh, whatever it is, I've, I, I've heard that, uh, you go to rollsafe.org, it gives you a lot of like information about how to use Molly safely, um, so I, I don't know, I'm all about just like rational, common sense, education to drugs, and not the totally futile and like, just ridiculous message that don't do drugs, like come on, like. Gener like we all do drugs, and it, it really drives me nuts when people who drink alcohol, you know, come to me with an anti-drug message. Like, alcohol is the fucking hardest drug that I've ever seen. Seriously, I mean, I I've never seen people act quite as crazy on any other drug than I have on alcohol. So we're, I mean, we have sanctioned the hardest drug to be used legally in this country and throughout the world, and you know, cigarettes too, of course. And, so let's, you know, let's stop being so disingenuous and just fucking have an honest conversation. I think what you find now more at the uh, big music festivals is there, there's always usually a group of people there that, that are kind of, t do, that's the fight they're on. They want to get the message out there like, you know, this is how to do things safely. This is how to, you know, not abuse things. And, but also at, this, at these events or at these things, a lot of these people are younger. And, you know, when you're younger, you don't give a fuck, like, if someone tells you something, you just you want to do the opposite just because, like, right? It's, like, it's unsafe to do this once, three times a week, and you're like, fuck it, I'm gonna do it five times, and you know, like, it, it, that's just your mentality. I think when you're younger, you just don't want to listen. You you, like, you could be the, the smartest, you could be the the biggest expert in the world, and you go up to a kid, and he's gonna be like, yeah, dude, I don't give a fuck. That's true to an extent, but that's why. I, but I mean, I believe. You would know better than me in a way, but like, okay, what's gonna cause a more like distinct re rebellion? Like, if you say don't do drugs, or if you say do drugs safely. I mean, there's nothing really to rebel against if you say do drugs. It's like we're giving you permission to do the drugs. I mean, I don't, I don't know. When I started experimenting, I was worried. Uh, not worried, but I was like, I was interested in being educated. I was young. I was stupid and reckless, but I was interested in like not. I had some awareness of long-term thinking. So, I mean, I think you should give young people a little more credit. It's not all, like, knee-jerk rebellion. Like, there is some desire to be smart. I guess I'm basically... It's, self, it's like self-preservation. It's like you said, like, you had your thing with ecstasy, and, you know, now you're kind of over it. Um, like, my thing is I want to be able to use MDMA maybe throughout my whole life, every couple of years, and always just enjoy it, and always just have, like, a reasonable space for it, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be this whole like extreme level of experimentation followed by total sobriety. I think the, one of the reasons I, I don't do it as often is because I have been in a relationship for about a year now, and it seems like when you're single, you you're more uh, apt to do get in these sort of situations than when you're with, with a girlfriend for a long time. And you said, I think you said you're in a you're married. I am married. How are you married for? Uh, yeah, just over a year. 
but we've been together like a long time. I've been with her since uh, 04, 05. Is it wow? So is she, does she enjoy uh, take, partaking in certain things with you? Yeah, I mean she's you know I'm a pot smoker and she's a drinker. Um, mm. Like you know beyond that, I wouldn't want to share too much about like what we do. But we tri we've we've tripped out together. Certainly, we've definitely experienced like the, a bond over psychedelic experimentation and uh, you know other things. Um, you know, it doesn't. It almost doesn't seem like my place to include her too much in that discussion. But yeah, it's like For sure. you know, she's she's not she she enjoys getting intoxicated. I would say she's not a big nit, is what you're trying to say. She's not. That is kind of what I was trying to say. She's not a nit. She's not a brute. Let's put it in poker terms as best as we can. She's not very nitty. <laughs> she's not a nit when it comes to lifestyle. Yeah, no. I think that, that makes it uh, much easier. Probably. Whoa! 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 <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Smoker's cough, is that what that is? It is. It is. I mean, but I've had it since, like, the first time I smoked when I was 17. I remember that. Like, my girlfriend at the time was like, you have really bad cough. Yeah. You're like, yeah, it happens. How old are you now? You're 30-something? 30, 30, uh, 37. Just turned 37. 30, you might be the oldest person to ever, to ever <laughs> play online poker, kid. You know, 37 years old, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I thought you were going to say oldest person on the podcast, but you're actually more correct. Oldest person to ever play online poker. You honestly might be the oldest person I ever have on a podcast, too. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, but actually, no, I mean, yeah. most of my friends are pretty, I mean, they're, they're older, like, my, like, LaFore, he's 32, and, like, I, I think most people are older than I know. I actually don't know many real young people in poker, because everyone that I kind of talk to or that plays high-stakes PLO... They've been around for for a bit of time now, so my circle's definitely not on the younger side. It's, it's well, how old are you? Twenty eight. So you're not that young yourself. I know. I'm old. I'm so old. I know. I agree. Well, I mean, and the gap shrinks. I mean, twenty eight starts to feel a lot like thirty seven pretty quickly. I'll tell you. But that, not that that's a bad thing. Like it just you know, or they say time time moves faster and faster as you go on. But yeah, sure. Like so, you've been in the game since what? Oh five or. No, 2008. Oh, okay. 2008. Yeah, I started playing 10 cent, 25 cent when I was in Chicago, living there, and uh, worked my way worked my way up the up the ranks. So I mean, right? Like even the guys, you know, even guys who started really young back when I started, they're hitting 30. They're close to 30. I mean, for me, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I was kind of I was kind of old for that online poker boom. Like I had a whole I had a whole life sort of or you know, I had a whole set of experiences before the internet came around, much less online poker. Um, so that, I guess that's where my perspective on that's a little different than some people. Like people who are twenty, a lot of people who are twenty-eight now, they've been playing online poker professionally their their whole adult lives. It's it's kind of crazy to me, or just interesting. So you you were um, before you officially like started just giving out on poker, what were you doing before? I, I feel like I vaguely know, but were you living You were living in New York City or were you living in L.A.? I was living in New York City. That's where I made the transition. It was where I sort of like discovered professional poker. Um, I was doing like shit jobs and selling weed. Um, I was, uh, my most re I mean, my most recent job before poker was working at a restaurant. That's what I thought. Okay, I thought you were a server and you were yeah, I was. Server. We still called them waiters back then. Um, yeah, I was a waiter. I was a busboy. Before that, I worked in an office. Um, before that, I pretty much did bike messenger work, either you know, or weed or sold weed. Those are the two things I did till my mid twenties. Um, and uh, yeah, then like, I then I I figured out that some of my friends were becoming professional poker players, and I like, tried to sort of emulate what they were doing. And I'm still trying. <laughs> so you you only play uh, tournaments still? You play some live and then so you're living in Santa Monica right now. So yeah, I don't play much cash. I don't play much live cash. What do you What do you usually talk about in this podcast? Like the value of student connectors and like like having a balanced range. Or I ask you a question. 
Do I seem like the kind of guy who talks about value city fucking connectors and having bounce range and anything? Come on. You said it's mostly a PLO strategy podcast, right? Well, no, I mean, we, I don't talk much fucking strategy. This is my this is how my podcast go in the PLO. This is how it began. I, I I I play with all the players. I hate a lot of them, so I just talk shit. I'd be like, all right, this guy he's good, but I fucking hate him. I want to punch him in the face. Or this guy is really good, and we talk about some plays. Then I started getting guests on, and usually when I have guests on, we just talk for hour, two hours, three hours. We just talk about poker, mindset. We just talk about, I don't know, we talk about anything. There's no... Gosh. Wait, but so the podcast started with you, like, like sort of like a training video? Like you... No, that, I hate... I, I'm, I'm very anti-training video. It was more like just an entertaining perspective on the games from okay. someone who's played the games before, who knows all the players. And the people at very micro stakes PLO might have got some sort of training value out of it, but it's no... There's no in-depth range analysis or breakdown of the hands. It's just me going over a hand, you know, picking out some interesting hands that were played that week and sort of talking about them in an entertaining way. Gotcha. And then, like I said, now it's guests and me and the guests. Like, we go over some hands throughout the podcast, but we usually just talk and you get a little insight into the mind of, you know, someone who's had success at a high-stakes level of the game that people are generally playing. And, you know, these are pretty smart guys and usually having on, so... I feel like you could get something away from it, like you know. Yeah, I love it. it. Sounds like sounds like a great, uh, great idea for a podcast. The kids, yeah. you know, there's great buzz in the streets, man. People are listening. You, you were saying, I don't know what, what streets you're hanging out on, kid, but uh, NVG, <laughs> the streets of NVG and Twitter. Oh, the streets of NVG and Twitter. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like you know, with the feedback I've gotten on my, it seems like everyone pretty much enjoys it, and you know, I think it's hard not to, for the most part, if you're a fan of poker, because. Like I said, you get to hear these people that, you know, get to hear inside the minds of some of these guys from a different perspective. A lot of times when people do poker podcasts, it's guys that have never really played poker or had any success at poker or, it, you know, it, it's just you don't really know and you have no reason to be interested in them. And the, the, the sort of conversation they have with the guests is always a very similar structured conversation. You're not really getting anything new out of it. So I think when you listen to something like mine, is you get you you get a real – a different feel on the conversation you have, and yeah, I can ask questions that other people wouldn't ask because they just have never been there and they don't really know that dynamic exists or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's right. Less of an outside looking in. Mm -hmm. But then I wanted to do this series, the Poker Life Podcast one. Like I, I had Bart Anson and I had Jamie Kerstetter on. Do you know Jamie? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, just to talk to different people. Like with you, we could do a PLO podcast, but we can just talk about poker and talk about we're like. Even if we're not talking much about poker, we just get to hear, you know, some entertaining type of shit. And I think that's ultimately what people want in poker is they want to be entertained. They want to hear something different. So, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. I, yeah I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. That's great. Are you, it's are you, fun. Well, I think it's, it's also fun, as you see with doing your podcast. It's a great way to just talk to people you might never talk to as well. It is that. Yeah. It really, yeah. That is kind of the cool thing. I think getting other people's perspective, and I, I do like this whole just like easy to broadcast medium, and just I don't know, it's cool. Yeah, it might be a, you know, there's a lot of people now vying for our attention, like so we're competing against all the other podcasts and great television shows and mm -hmm. Howard Stern. So, <laughs> with your podcast, is there like? Do you have a sort of goal, like when with them? Is, it, is do you want to make it as popular as you can be? Do you want to just have like a, a solid core audience that tunes in all the time? You know, like w what's your goal with it? Where's your direction that you kind of want to go with it? Is it just like more casual, just like you know, do it and if people listen, they listen? No, I think more of the first thing you said. I mean, we want to build it to whatever. You know, we want to expand the platform as much as we can. Um, but at the same time, I mean, really, our only goal is to produce good episodes. Like, there's only really, you know, again, it's like the podcasting. You're you're, you're vying for a lot of you're you're one among many people vying for attention um, from the public, and it's just I. So you know, our only goal can really be to produce good episodes, and it's unfair. You know, I think people are almost like more interested in poker. Like, if we did a poker podcast, I bet we could get bigger numbers. In a way, I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, I think it's it like, does. Yeah. Um. But um. So no, I don't. I don't. We. I don't. I don't have long-term goals for it. Let's just say, 
I have short-term goals that I could see leading to various long-term outcomes. Like my sh our short-term goal is just like make it sound really good, have it come out every week, um, get guests on whenever possible, and you know just try to stay true to the sort of uh, concept or philosophy. But you know at the same time we know it's going to evolve. It, it's you know it's going to evolve from something to something else. So. Just try to serve the product week to week as good as we can. And yeah, I don't know, then promote it and try to get more people listening and keep listening. And the Slate article did help promote it, <laughs> um, help get us out to a new audience a little bit. So, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that answered your question. It's just like... Oh, it does. It's an, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a question that has a big answer. You know, if, you, if someone asked me that same question about mine, you know... I don't fucking know. I have a, I have an idea, but I don't necessarily know what the goal is. I think the goal is just like put out good content, as you said. You know, make sure the episodes are good, and then you're just kind of networking in a way. You're you're just building your network. You're meeting people that you might not have necessarily met, and you know, you're not really sure what doors or what avenues might open for you to yeah go down further. Yeah, that's exactly right. And but also, I mean, I. I you, you were. I, I assume you and I both. We enjoy expressing ourselves. Um, that you know, I, I, I enjoy expressing myself or trying to communicate. I enjoy trying to be a good communicator. I enjoy hearing people's stories. Um, and you know, if I could entertain someone, that's great too. Uh, but just basically, my philosophy, especially since poker, is just like if anyone wants to put a microphone in front of me, I will, I will speak to it. Um, I will talk into it. It's like I'm I, I've since I was you know 17, I've been kind of putting myself out there in the same way. Like I, you know, I've I was I was oversharing before the internet made oversharing standard. Like like these sorts of things that I that I now. Um, share about just like, I don't know, just different weird aspects of my life. I started doing that when I was 17, writing for the New York Press, or even before that, writing for the high school newspaper. I would write about sort of unconventional things, and I would put myself out there and kind of just like try to develop a dialogue on a new level and just like see what, see, see what it would be like to turn my life into an open book in a way. Or, but at the same time, I keep tons of stuff private, so it's like you actually... The more you put out there in like a sort of like solid, like forthright way, like the more control you have over all your information. It's kind of interesting that way. But for whatever reason, I've always that's just always what I've gravitated towards. Just sort of like let me try to express something honestly. And you know, podcasting is kind of perfect for that. Mm -hmm. um, even though, as you can tell now, I'm just rambling on and don't really have a way to organize my thoughts all the time. <laughs> that's. Sometimes, you know, it's just about this way. That's what the podcast is for. Sometimes you just fucking ramble on and you don't make a point sometimes, but that's it's what it's, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily matter. I enjoy, you know, I enjoy tons and tons of podcasts while I was grinding poker, especially in Mexico. Like, it was a very isolating environment for me. Um, so to be able to have, to be able to hear, like, two articulate people have a conversation, I, I found it was, like, a great distraction. Like, if I try listening to music for hours on end, I don't know, it either affects the way I'm playing, it would affect the way I was playing poker, or it would affect my enjoyment of the music. You know, it's like now you're associating, it's almost like that clockwork orange thing, now you're associating music with work. Um, but to listen to people have a conversation, which you don't even really have to focus on, it just can kind of be in the background, I just found that very, I don't know, just very enjoyable. And I, the first thing I did when I got to Canada, like after Black Friday, it took me like three months to move, I was like so reluctant to move, um, but the first thing I did was uh, subscribe to Howard Stern, subscribe to Sirius. It was really weird. Like I hadn't listened to Stern for several years since he moved to Satellite, but somehow, just like as soon as I moved, I knew I had to like start listening to Howard Stern again. It's like just something about talk radio that's home for me. That creates like a home, a feeling of home. It's interesting. I found that when I listen to podcasts in the background. I feel like I get more distracted, but I, I've never tried just listening on a, as you said, you can kind of space out a bit sometimes and just not yeah. worry about it too much. I feel like I work, like when I miss something, I'm like, wait, what did I just miss, you know, and I can't actually just like put it on as a secondary thing and 
listen to it when I'm listening to it when I need to focus. Just you know, focus on playing and not worry about it. I have yeah, like I have gears. Like it's like I'll tune in and tune out, and then if I like hear something that I know I want to go back, I will. You know, you're 24 tabling. It's not that hard to 24 table and uh, hit 30 seconds back a couple times, or you know. What I, don't I, 20, I do, I'm just huh? I don't 24 table much anymore. Yeah, you know what I mean. You, if you're yeah. multitasking playing online poker, I never 24 table. I was like nine to 12 was my max or whatever, and it's just, you know what I'm saying. It's just um, it also helps pass hour to hour. A podcast is usually an hour, or in the case of your podcast and Joe Rogan's podcast, like three hours sometimes, but um, <laughs> just a, it just really kind of helps pass that time. Like, yeah. suddenly you've, you've just heard a conversation, and now it's, well, for tournament players, like, now it's sync break, and I don't know. There's, there's somebody doing this right now, listening to this right now, that's doing that exact thing. They have this in the background. They're playing poker right now. What do you want to see? You want to say some good luck? Do you want to give them some advice? Uh, for good luck. Good, good luck, and subscribe to my podcast, and keep listening to podcasts. Is there really someone doing that, or are you just assume we're just like... There, of course there's someone. People course always there. tell me, they always listen, they always play when they listen to my podcast. Well, hopefully they're relating to this, you know, it is that it's a, a decent way to just sort of, I don't know, get through an hour of grinding online poker. Yeah, so we have a couple, a couple comments. Rob OT says, why the fuck are you doing this when World Cup starts? I actually forgot World Cup started today. I don't really follow soccer that much, and I forgot yeah. today was the it's like the kickoff game. I actually think it's going on right now. So, yeah. Well, I mean, if what you know, it literally, we're competing with the World Cup kid. Exactly. We're competing with the World Cup kickoff. That's yeah. That might, we have 17 viewers. I can't believe we have 17 viewers. Usually, there's like you know, uh, there might be a bit more, but World Cup is going on, and it seems like most poker players are very obsessed with World Cup. Usually, we usually would have like 24 viewers. We might have like 30 or 40 or 50, which I mean, I don't know if that's a lot. It's a lot for me. It's a, it seems like a it's there's 40 people tuning into what you're putting out. That seems pretty cool to me. Sure, <laughs> especially live. I mean, well, the whole thing is listen to the podcast when the World Cup is off, right? I mean, I think that's what most people are going to do. Um, no, but hey, I have no, I have no, very little World Cup awareness myself. Yeah. Hey, Sven asks, how did you get Bradley Cooper on here? You do kind of look like Bradley Cooper, in a way. No? I've been uh, hearing that a couple times lately. I'll take it. I'll take that. He's My friend said I should get work as his body double. I'll take that too. If anyone out there has that, to, for sure. Lance Beckman says, "Can can you ask Shane if he knows Kirk Morrison? He should have him on the podcast." Um, I don't know him well. I know him. I mean, he. Uh, we were friendly for the couple couple years he was around the poker scene. Not friendly, but like friendly around the poker table, mm. and small talk friendly. But if you, Who is Kirk Morrison? Is he a? Is he a? Um, I don't want to speculate because I have an, I, I think I might know, but I'm not quite sure. Kirk Morrison um, was a, a guy who was around like before I was around. So before '05, he was like a, a well-known poker player who then disappeared from the scene for a while. Um, came back and like he, uh, he was friends with Daniel Negreanu and just got like kind of right back in action and started. Um, I guess put up some results in poker tournaments and. And then just disappeared again. As far as I know, I don't know. I don't, he does seem like a really interesting guy that uh, marches to the beat of his own drummer. Um, but I don't know him well. If that person who asked the question can put me in touch with him, I would be delighted. Um, but well, I don't know him well. He just, he's just like one of these like enigmatic poker figures. Like another guy like that is uh, Andy. Andy Black. Remember that guy from Ireland? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, facial hair. These are old school guys. Shit, man. These it's are not like, that old. I mean, this is all modern era. Like, Andy Black is another guy who was known for disappearing for a while, coming back. Then he made, like, the main event final table, I think. And I think he's disappeared again. And the funny thing he said, I remember playing with him, like, that when you disappear from poker for a while and then you just come back, the person to your left is just like, oh, hey, nice to see you again. It's like they don't even notice you're gone, really. Like, no one really... Going back to my theory that no one actually gives a shit about anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking up right now. I'm, that's the guy I remember, Andy Black. The world's he made that. He made that WSOP final t main event final table, I think, right? He did, right? Yeah. What year was it? I, I, yeah, it all, oh, it all it all blurs together, but oh, well, five. But he, oh five. Yeah. So yeah, and then he was around for a couple of years and playing the circuit regularly, but I don't see him around ever at all anymore. 
Looks like he just hangs out in Ireland playing uh, Irish Opens type of that stuff. That could be, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Steve Vassy asks, how was it working with Poker Stars? That's actually an interesting question. How was it working with Poker Stars? Uh, that was great. That was a great experience. Did you, uh, that's, okay, I was going to answer. Do you, uh, get, did, how do they pay you? How does that work? Can you, are you allowed to talk about it? Um, I mean, the terms, you know, the terms of your compensate of one's compensation are confidential, but they, they compensate you. It's sort of like they, they, they give you money in exchange for representing their product. Um, why'd they choose you to represent, ask, huh? why'd they choose you to represent the, the, the product then, do you think? Um, that was a team online thing. That was um, it was the second year of team online, and uh, the, well, it was an open call, open application, and I think I just sort of fit the criteria of what they were looking for. They were looking for an MTT player, um, someone with a blog, communicator, uh, I guess, and yeah, I'd, and I don't know. I'd recently had a, like a big final table. Maybe that helped. Maybe that didn't even have. Maybe I, I got my timing wrong. But I just think it was right place, right time. Because like the first year of, of Team Online, they went. They they just had a different um, a different approach to like recruiting or signing up people. They went more with like high volume Supernova Elite type grinders, and I think they kind of wanted to round out the nature of Team Online that second year and add like a couple MTT guys. And you kind of see the direction that Team Online went. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, did you get to a lot? Do you have a lot of like um, behind the scenes type of conversations with people from Poker Stars, sort of thing like that? Um, like nothing too juicy that you know you would thrill to. And if it was, I probably wouldn't say you know. But no, they were very, you know, just like I, I always felt they were um, easy to deal with as a customer. Um, they were very easy to deal with in a in a working relationship. Who you know. Um. Yeah, there's nothing that, you know. That pretty much anything that you could read, juice-wise about stars is on the internet. It's like you know anything like salacious. I just you know it was, it was pretty fluid, easygoing working relationship, and and you know I still think they're the best site that probably ever was or ever will be. Um, so it's just like I just look at it as like a privilege to have worked for them, and it was cool. I definitely agree. The same sentiments. Poker Stars is by far better than all the untracked Euro sites and all the terrible American sites that currently exist at, at the uh, at this moment in time. Yeah, <laughs> and they and they're just they're just well well run. They seem to have a good corporate ethic. Mm -hmm. So I just experienced that on the back end, but nothing you know, nothing too interesting. Just like yeah. Um, I had certain duties, obligations. So, uh, you're supposed to play a certain number of hours, and some of your compensation is tied into, how, you know, the the rake you pay or the volume you pay, but uh, play. But it's just pretty much it was an endorsement deal. So what's your, what's your poker life like now? So World Series is going on. You're still in California. You know, what's your, like, how, how often are you playing poker on the internet? How often are you relocating? And, you know, what are your World Series of Poker plans? Um, I've played poker on the internet exactly one, maybe two days this year. I think I played a T-Coop. I went down to Mexico to play a T-Coop. Um, and uh, then I played, like, a handful of live tournaments. And then I played a few World Series events. But um, and I, might go, I might go back out tonight or tomorrow to play the weekend events. Basically, the plan for the summer is to play just the remaining weekend events and the main event. Um, kind of just like keeping with this theory that if I if I proportion my poker playing correctly, that I will have better results in a way. Because, um, for instance, I can't stand being in Vegas right now. Like, I, I, Vegas right now is loathsome to me. It's like I could be there right now trying like every day to grind out a tournament and win a tournament. And but, you know, you really wind up busting a lot of tournaments and then you walk through that really hot parking lot to get to your car to get somewhere where which is again not home. Um, I just I, I maybe it's just a function of age, but I just find that very wearing on me. So I'm hoping that just like spending a few days in uh California in the middle of the week, working on my writing and other aspects of my life, 
and then going to Vegas for the weekend, maybe I'll uh, put up a result. We'll see. Or, or maybe not, but either way, you know, I'll be happier. <laughs> I'll be happier. I'm enjoying this, like, fresh ocean breeze right now. There's no equivalent in the middle of, Nevada, in, in the middle of Nevada in, in June. However, it's a good opportunity to try to, you know, bank off a nice score, so I'm going to go up and try to give it a couple shots. So are you one of those tournament players that sells action everything and is in a lot of markup and... Makeup or markup? Markup. I'd actually all of it. I'm all of it. I'm the worst. I'm like the worst example of a professional poker player. Like, um, it's just I've I always uh, my pattern is to make money. Um, well, I'm back. You know, I've been back like almost my whole career, and that's because like from the beginning, it's like I would make some money, blow it, not have the, uh, any kind of bankroll for the buy-ins I wanted to be playing. Um, then like grind it out for a while, make some more money, and then it's just like you know blow it basically. It's like the money, like because you go stretches without having money, and then I get my money and it starts burning a hole in my pocket, and I just I'm the worst at long term planning and bankroll management and money management. So that's you know that's real. So that's maybe a good reason to not be a professional poker player. <laughs> it's, well, it, it's so it's uh you know at cash games. I think early in my career I had that problem too, where I I would I would end up taking shots at higher stakes and losing both of my money, having to move back down and rebuild. But I also think it helped me build up the skill to be more responsible, whereas I guess in a situation like you're in, it's hard to build up that skill when it's not necessarily your money anymore when you're backed and when you're, you know, it, it actually might be a better long-term thing for you to get better at, you know, like instead of using the excuse like I'm just fucking terrible at doing, you know, managing my own money, eventually... Like the hundredth time, that's what happened to me. Like the hundredth time I did it, I was like, you know what? I better fucking figure this out because otherwise, I'm gonna keep being in the same pattern for. And, and I'm realizing that too, and it's just you know, I make some progress um, defeating that pattern, and then I see myself uh, repeating it at the same time. So I yeah, it definitely, it's not a good thing to make excuses about. It's just um. A matter of time, I guess. Um, but and you make a really good point. It's like I don't. I didn't have that thing where I had to, where I, I was ever forced to like go go down and rebuild and grind it out in that way. I've always just had a way to be dependent on people who had the correct bankroll to invest in me. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a source of I don't know shame in my uh, poker. Life, I guess, or whatever, my poker career. But I have the, uh, I think I have the honest self assessment part down, um, where it's just like I realize that it really, you know, it's been my weakness for a long time. And um, I, can't, I have no one to blame but myself. And it's just like trying to examine the reasons for it is the tricky part. Like I have my, my I had friends all along the way tell me, just like, this is what you should be doing. And like, you should be grinding cash. People tried to get me grinding cash for so many years. It just like never quite stuck. I was never like enjoyed it or was good at it. Um, and I was just never good at just like doing that whole grinding thing. And then I don't know. I got good at kind of grinding tournaments for a while, but again, my problem is like I'll take the money offline, spend it, spend too much, just think the money will keep coming easily. And it's just like a psychological trap that I fall into over and over again. I think that's one of the big reasons why a lot of people do get staked for cash games is the psychological effect is hard to deal with when you're not making that money or you lose a big you lose a big score. It affects your your A game turns into your C game, and whereas when you're staked, your A game continues to be maybe your A minus game or your B plus game when the money is not necessarily yours that you're losing, but it's the staker's money. So I have friends that are still staked now that have been winning for six years at cash games that are still staked to this day, and obviously, you, you know, you, you're, the being a friend, you tell them, like, you know, what are you thinking? What are you doing? You're just giving money away. But, the, but you know, if they have a losing month or two, then that's going to affect their next maybe two or three months, and they're not going to be able to make any money those two or three months, whereas, you know, in the situation they're in now, they're, they'll be able to play a bit better. So, you know, that, that also might, that's also a reason for staying in the position to be staked, too, is you just feel like you're going to play better. Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, I don't know if that works necessarily as well in tournaments, but uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, like that that level of structure and accountability to someone else kind of keeps your friends on their game. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, of course, I the problem with tournament staking is 
I, there's still no really like good business model for it. It's really tough. Like, you know, makeup is a really tough thing for a horse. Um, it doesn't necessarily enable you to play your A game. Um, you know, knowing that you have to uh, sorry, one sec. Um, knowing that you have to uh, I totally lost my train of thought. We're yeah, no one you have you know, the, just the idea that you look up on like, you know, the score like the the payouts and it's like you need sixth place to fucking just like clear your makeup and like it's a, that's a, it's a really toxic way of thinking. Um yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, if I was in that position, I always think about that like I don't want to fucking like I don't even know how to play. If you're if you look at this payouts and like third 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 place, you're not at a makeup yet and you're just like <laughs> yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's like an extreme, but like, there there are bet yeah. I've had I've had some interesting backing deals that like took that psychological pressure of makeup off, and that I think I don't know. It's just it's still just really hard to to figure out a good business model with um with backing tournaments from from what I can see. I don't know. It seems to just drag a lot of people down on both sides, and yeah, I just I yeah, it's my own money. Really Huh? Well, it seems like what the the thing, the smart thing to me from an outsider's perspective, really, is the people that sell action like in packages for like a series or daily sort of things that sell it on two plus two in the marketplace. Yeah, but you're not actually keeping any makeup in that because you're just selling for individual things, and obviously that's that has its own hassle in its own right because you have to keep doing it and you have to keep getting money from different people and stuff like that. But that seems like a decent long term idea if you're not don't want to stay in the makeup part. No, I've done that, and I've done that too. And but and now there seems to be like a, I don't know. The, I'm not sure that that's such a great deal for investors because it's a you know it's a short term proposition where you're you know you're paying you're basically paying someone on their long term ROI with the invest with the markup price, and it's a short term investment. So, I mean that's cool. That, there's a really good deal for actually the horses. Um, to get one t one time markup deals and get a little free roll that way, um, but yeah, then there's all these other hassles like you were saying, collecting the money, being on display for a group of investors, when the ideal really would be just to back yourself and have all your own action. Like that's the other end of the extreme. And yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I I think if I told people like outside of poker that there's a certain subsection of the people that other people pay them to play and they don't actually have any of their own money to play with, they may be a little confused, like, wait, that doesn't make much sense. Why would you play poker to make money that you don't you don't you don't play with your own money? It's just the tournament world's a weird place for me. Oh uh, right. Well then there, then there's something in the biggest game in town, uh, old book that was like, you should never play poker with your own money. <laughs> I mean I kinda like, you know, for, there is there is part of me that like your friends who are backed, I mean, maybe I would have chosen to be backed my entire career. Like that would be fine if I had just taken my share of the winnings and saved it wisely and practiced delayed gratification better and bought fewer clothing and went out to fewer meals or whatever it is. I spent back in the day, you know, I gambled in the pit too much as well. I don't really do that anymore, but um, that certainly like. You know, when you come, like you were describing with uh, MDMA and the and the rave scene, it's like when you come on the poker scene and there's money and craps games. It's like you just want to shoot, take a flag to the dice table. It's like that seems that seems to make sense at a certain point in in your like poker life or in mine. And in, in 05, when the money just seemed like endless, like it was just gonna, I didn't have much, but it was it still felt like it was just gonna keep coming and coming. It's like, oh yeah, let's just. Just gamble five, ten k at the Bellagio, and I don't know. Yeah, all kinds of leaks. It's like you gotta really watch your ass. Yeah, obviously nowadays you need to be a bit tighter on your um, on your away from the table leaks because, as you said before, money was seemed like it was coming in pretty freely, and these days, if you read a lot of what people say, it's poker's dying, no one can win, edges are small, games are. Yada yada yada, yeah, hard stuff like that. The poker's not dying. It's uh, like, uh, it's harder than it was in '03, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's also why it's just like I, 
to an extent, it's almost like that's why I just I prefer to reduce, like, lower my own expectations by becoming a recreational player again. Mm -hmm. um, so what else are your days spent doing now? So you wake up in Santa Monica. You you wake up. You're you're with your wife. Uh yeah. You look in the mirror. Then we're we're actually separated what? right now, but that's a different story. But whatever. Wait, wait, wait what did you say? My wife and I are currently living separately. That's a, a Joey Ingram exclusive. But oh, we're still married. I do see my wife all the time. Um, I wake up and I try to do some writing. I, I brew a cup of coffee, smoke a cigarette, try to do some writing. Um, I try to do some exercise, like ride my bike or play tennis. And then it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, different things every day. I, it's a pretty full life managing just my errands and my various responsibilities. And uh, it really changes week to week. But my focus is like a level of physical health and um, just like a basic level of physical health and uh, time management, trying to spend time writing even when I'm not like necessarily – in the zone or inspired, just treating it more like a job, grinding it out, um, which is a challenge. And then, yeah, just like juggling a million other things, including my crazy marriage. <laughs> we need to do an anonymous marriage podcast, I think, where we talk about the marriage. The, the marriage. Sure. I yeah. think that'd be, quite, that'd be quite interesting. It sounds interesting, obviously, that you're separated, but you still see each other. Well, it's, yeah, I don't even, I, I'm, maybe I shouldn't even reveal that, but it doesn't really matter. It's, we have a really, compli like, our, our relationship is complicated over a long term. Um, so you're kind of like Hank Moody from Californication. You're a writer, yeah. you have a complicated marriage, yeah. I mean, you live in Santa Monica, can it be any, or is, the, is, that, is that show about you? Minus the writing, no, it's like about a, a successful version of me. Like, it's like if I were successful and had, you know, like a writing career to look back on, that might be more about me. But no, uh, yeah, I can relate to that character. He is a uh, he lives one town over. Um, but he's you know right. It's more like uh, sure Hank Moody minus the writing success. So Hank Moody obviously has sex with a lot of attractive younger women. No, right. My mine is that as well. Yeah, well, yeah. I pretty much just sit in my apartment and jerk off. That could be you. You know, you you wear your leather jacket outside. You go play tennis. You, you um, but you meet a nice, attractive girl. You bring her back home, and you know, and that's. You know, we'll see where we're at in five, ten years. Um, you know, he, he that, the character is a little bit older than me, so. Um, but you know, and right, he's got his Karen. He's got the woman, you know, the woman of his dreams, who he just like can't seem to make it work with. And we'll see how that goes with me. <laughs> But I do, you know, I love my wife, like, extremely. It's like, it's not even like, so when you say, like, you're still talking, it's like, it's more than we're still talking. It's like we're still trying to, like, navigate through our mutual insanity. The, the journey through life, huh? It's a, yes. It's an adventure. It's not always easy, you know? It's, it's ups and downs and arounds and arounds and... Uh, it is, man. Smoke a lot. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Huh? <laughs> you smoke a lot. Well... I mean, you've got me talking about personal stressful things. So plus, we're being, <laughs> now we're now we're like at the therapy, huh? Now we're like we're sitting on the couch. No, we're. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, uh, and I don't. I don't. I just came from therapy today, and I don't get to smoke in therapy. So, um, but yeah. Um, how how long actually did you uh, want to hang out? <laughs> I know I have no time. I'm I'm here. I'm I'm just. <laughs> I'm enjoying the conversation, you know. I'm, you live this astructural life. I have like I'm like okay, I gotta go do laundry. Like I'm going to my wife's new house to do laundry after I leave here, mm -hmm. and uh, then okay, then I've got another therapy session <laughs> this afternoon, a couples therapy session. So if you really want insight into my life, now you, now you're getting it. Love it. Um, and Love then it. it'll you know the therapy session will let out around seven. So the choice becomes to uh, drive out to Vegas tonight and try to play tomorrow's 2500 or rest and sleep. And, uh, yeah, that's yeah. what you're advising? I'm, I'm all, I'm all anti-tournaments, man. Don't go to Vegas. <laughs> well, okay, but look at this. You know, this is like a spot for me to earn. Um, yeah, so you definitely should go to Vegas then. Is that 2500 uh, again? I'll probably, you know, I could, I could conceivably leave for Vegas around 8, 9 tonight and get there uh, around midnight, 1. 
mm. and uh, shack up at a friend's house and play a tournament tomorrow and win a bracelet by Monday. Um, is that what this weekend is? Um, wait, I can win a bracelet by Sunday. Six handed, you play a six handed one? Oh, that's 10k six handed. You don't no, play that? 2,500 no. uh, full ring. Oh, okay. Uh, but then, and then the weekend tournaments. But yeah, so no, I don't know. I was just, uh, that's where I'm at. I'm enjoying talking to you as well. I was just curious if there's a, uh, you, you seem to thrive more on the astructural. Uh, I don't, like, I don't I've never had a structure in my life. <laughs> never. Yeah, like, and I, and I never, I, I don't know. I struggle with the need for it. Like, I, 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 some structure helps me. I think some structure would definitely help me too. But I don't know. I sleep whenever I want. I wake up whenever I want. I just go to the gym whenever I feel fresh and like you know. I feel, like, I, feel I play a lot of basketball. I play basketball like every day or six days a week. So, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm always excited to go to the gym and just play basketball and work out. I'm into diet a lot too, so that kind of all. There's always there's always a pickup game at the gym or what? Well, I do a lot of workouts by myself. I just work out my game. It's kind of like you're grinding poker in a way. You're just playing by yourself. I just go there and play by myself and just focus on getting better at certain things. I actually, I, I started playing basketball in September. And I feel like I've gotten pretty good, and a lot of people that I play with now, like they can't believe I've been playing for a short time. And I tell them I just approach basketball like I do playing poker. Like, figure out where I'm good at, figure out where I'm bad at, try to improve the weaknesses, try to take advantage of the strengths, and just putting in the work and grinding and just, you know, that's how I got good at poker was just putting in the hours and kept working relentlessly at it, so. What's your, uh, what's your clutch shot? My go-to shot? Yeah. Well, my go-to shot would be I would drive left-handed and then I would step back off my right foot and do like a dirt shot here. I, I'll, I'll even show you. I got my practice basketball right here. <laughs> the power of the live stream, my friend. So let's say, let's say you're guarding me. You're guarding me right here. I'll take you in left. I'll post up here. I'll move put this foot in right here. Uh -huh. Put this foot up and shoot the ball on you. Gotcha. And that would work um, very large percentage of the time. Did you uh, did you grow up in Chicago? Yeah, I grew up in Chicago. Yeah, I, uh, all my life pretty much. And now I'm back here. Uh, so you, do you play online poker? I play online poker every day. Where do you play? On track girl sites, of course. Where else would I play? I don't know. I play on that. I, 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 I don't fucking know. I, you know, I've... Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's weird. It's like I just wish we had, like, online poker back the way it was. <laughs> um, um, completely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like I can't even get enthused about all these new online poker things going on in the United States. Oh, just for all in other states? It's just proving, like, the unregulated market was so much, or just, like, less regulation seems to be better. And now there's just like no, there's no market for it. There's yeah, too that, many laws. Yeah, like the the Bavada and, and the others, like you know, eight 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 or or party or um, you know, like iPoker. poker. The tournament, I mean, for a tournament player, I would not want to be a professional tournament player playing on those sites. But I know a lot of, I know as a stock, former stars representative. I don't know if you talk about this, but I, I'm pretty sure people playing from the United States on Poker Stars is kind of a prevalent thing in the tournament community. Yeah, I mean, like, I yeah. I always yeah, just right. people like, don't tell me. Like, I don't want to know. There's certain things I just don't want to know. Um, I do know. I know some people, and I know they play tournaments. So, I mean, that's that's where I'm coming from. But, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's... A, People, you know, YOLO, man, you know? Some people like drugs, some people like doing that, you know? It's just, you know, whatever you like kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, I wouldn't even consider, from, from my perspective, I would not even consider that. Um, mm -hmm. I just would never feel, like, completely comfortable um, playing by proxy. Um, not even not even risk of getting caught, just, like, it's like all these other people have gotten up and moved their whole asses to another country, Mm -hmm. um, I could never just quite feel right about firing up the Sunday Million uh, mm -hmm. via Team Viewer. I, yeah, don't know. I, I understand why some people would do it. You know, sometimes you deal with some uh, shady sites, some shady sites. You lose, you know, fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars on some of these sites, and then at some point in time, you're like, well, I can either risk losing all my money, or I can do this. You know, right? It's like, yeah, well, it's not, you know, it's it's. I think uh, people have different. Uh, 
Different everyone things. makes, yeah, I mean, everyone decides their own level of whatever, ethics or morals or standard practices. And, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, to me, it's just like online poker is kind of, yeah, I, I, it's just not in my life right now, for better or worse. It's like I, I, I'm interested to see what happens in California because, again, I would love to be playing the Sunday Million right here. Um, hopefully they let poker stars in. It's really... I'm very interested as well. I, I lived in San Diego for a couple of years, so I, I would love to move back there. Oh, man, yeah. I mean, right. The, the, yeah, it's a great lifestyle. I would actually maybe move to Santa Monica instead. Santa Monica, yeah, it's very nice here, man. That was my second option I was looking when I was living in San Diego. I was thinking about moving up to uh, up to around that area because I thought it would be a, a bit different experience than living in uh, living in San Diego. So, um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here in a couple minutes. Do you have any Dan Bilzerian stories? Steve wants to know. Steve asked. Uh, no. Seems like an interesting guy. Seems like a very interesting guy. Seems like he also likes to do drugs a lot as well. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it's somewhere in the background of those Instagram pics was a little pile <laughs> of cocaine. But I don't know. I have no insight into it. You think all the naked women just come for they come because there's no drugs involved, huh? No, I think there might be a pile of cocaine somewhere in the back. And that seems fine. Seems like everyone's pretty happy and productive, despite the I know. I, seems fine for me. I enjoy watching. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I say just, you know, put the, like, like if he, I don't know. I haven't seen any pictures of him, like, sniffing a line off anyone's tits. So, um, yeah. I don't know for sure. But, no, he does show, he shows himself um, taking bong hits and stuff, like, there's weed sometimes in the pictures. I just think it's actually fascinating what he's done um, in terms of like this whole like Instagram fame self promotion thing. It's pretty interesting. And like now he's 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 almost like eclipsed every other poker player in terms of like in terms of like uh, marketability. It's kind of weird. Seriously, the, in the general public, the non poker playing public, most if you ask most poker player, most people to say who's a famous poker player, they will say Dan Bilzerian. It's so bizarre. It's like, I'm seriously. No, I've, I've talked to people, like, I had my friend from Canada in town, and she was like, do you know this guy Dan Bilzerian? I was like, of course I know Dan Bilzerian. I'm pretty sure he's the most, like, famous poker player in the world right now, which is sick, <laughs> because he doesn't necessarily play poker, you know? It's, uh, well, no, he might actually be that successful. Like, the amounts he discusses winning in private games, I, I have no reason to doubt it, actually. Like, I would guess that he is up some eight-figure amount of money in in cash games this year. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, he could just be doing. He he's not really saying he's the best in the world. It's just he well, fosters a party environment with whale man, maniac whales, and you know, just think of how that can scale in your favor. For sure. Well, he said in the All In magazine they did a little video on him, and he said, "Well, if you put me in like a." poker game with a, a bunch of other good players, you know, I'm not that good, but the games I play in, I'm like fucking, I'm like fucking Bill Gates, you know, he's like the man, or he's like, you know, Mickey Mantle, or some, like you said some, like, uh, he made an analogy like that, and I was like, well, that's a very good point, you know, when you when you play with, you know, six fucking retards, they're, you know, whatever, retard, not a very strong word, very uh, sensitive word for some people, you play with six fucking idiots, then, uh, you know, you're gonna... You... Well, that's exactly it, I mean, that's where, like, Ego, managing your ego is really important. It's like some people think like being the best poker player is like being the smartest poker player or being able to describe a hand better than the next person. It, we know all kinds of people who, or whatever, or they're just, it, there's so many times when the second best player in the world is playing against the best player in the world mm -hmm. type of thing, they're going to lose. It's like, so just, if you can actually just find your sweet spot, that's probably, maybe he is the best professional poker player. Maybe, I mean, people, you know, he we, we we tend to assume he didn't grind it up from the low stakes. Like, he didn't start with a $20 deposit and get to play in these games for six, seven figures. No, but nevertheless, he seems to be beating the game of poker for more than most of us will ever be capable of. For sure. It is very... Uh, uh is a very interesting topic for sure. Uh, Randy Christing in the YouTube says, "Tell Shane he still owes me a crack smokeout session after busting me at <laughs> HTT Commerce." That was very funny. That guy's—I know exactly who that guy is. Uh -huh. I play. 
<laughs> we played a poker tournament the other day, like two or three weeks ago, and uh, I busted him. I got in with the best hand, um, just so we can remind Randy. Um, but no, he said something very funny as I was leaving. He was like, now you're going to have to smoke me out with some crack. <laughs> he just said that, like, like, sort of like, like, uh, like, oh, now you're gonna have to buy me a beer later. It was, and, I don't know. <laughs> the whole table just like sort of, I, there was like a, a reaction, kind of like, it was like, people, I was like, huh? I was like a little stunned. I thought it was in good taste. I thought he did it in a charming way. Um, but um, and then some other player at the table was like, is that sort of, is that standard after you busted? Just like I don't know, kind of, I don't know, needle someone. With knowledge of their life, but we all agreed it was sort of fine. But that's that's what he's referring to. He said after I busted him, he said, "Now you're gonna have to smoke me out with some crack." Hey, I take that. If someone asks, someone gives me an offer like that, I might okay, like let's go kind of thing. Like no, that. yeah, I don't think he was offering to smoke me out. He was saying I had to smoke him out. Oh, but cool. that's never gonna happen. Sorry, Randy. Sorry, Randy. Well, Shane, I'll let you get to your um. Laundry, your... Vegas prep, therapy, you know. Yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm thank you that for uh, for joining me on a uh, podcast here with me. If anyone wants to uh, check out your podcast, once again, it's dopestories.com. All the episodes up there. Um, at yep. Shane Schlegler. Shane uh, Schlegler. Uh, at Dope Stories on Twitter. At Shane Schlegler. Perfect. Uh, you know. Yeah. Dope wanna... Stories on iTunes. That that that's. Do we got anything else? That's it. Say what's if you see me at the World Series. Say what up. Cool. All right, Shane. Thanks for joining me. Thank and, you for having uh, me, Joey. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop the broadcast now, guys. Uh, lot next live stream coming uh, next week sometime. I'm doing a PLO podcast with Isil Drone. Very uh, psychotic Swedish heads our uh, mid stakes PLO player. So. Tune in then, guys. I'll update it on my Twitter and put it on YouTube. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Joe. That was fun, man.